Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here on The Father Show. And I'm your host, Mike Thompson. And I'm glad you decided to join us today because we've got a great show today. And I know this is going to be a show that a, a lot of fathers will need, especially if you have been alienated against and you think your kids are alienating you. So you definitely want to stay tuned because we got an expert that's going to tell us a lot about it and how some, some, how we can deal with it, get some strategies and some points that uh, she's very aware of and you can too. But if you have not subscribed to the show, please do and click that notification bell so that you can be notified every time we do a show. But ladies and gentlemen, be, without any further ado, I want to uh, bring in Miss Joan Cloth Zaynar. Joan, how are you doing? I'm good. Good. Nice to meet you in person. Pleasure meeting you as well. I've watched you on some of your videos that you've done. Um, I've even watched you where you uh, presented the parental alienation in front of the U.S. Uh, was it Congress, was it? It was the Connecticut Judiciary Committee. Okay. Um, but I've also testified for Maryland and a couple, quite a few other states too. Okay. So before we get too deep into it, why don't you tell our audience who you are and what is you know what makes you an expert? Okay, that's a tall order, but here we go. <laughs> so I have been working with vict surviving victims of abuse. So for at least 35 years, specializing in it, in parental alienation for the past 25 years. I really don't care what you call it, if you wanted the truth. You could call it hostile aggressive parenting. You can call it coercive control. You can call it domestic violence by proxy. You can call it psychological abuse, or you could call it your big left toe. What's more important to me is recognizing the patterns of behaviors, the signs, the symptoms, and how to properly treat it. So now how does that bring us to where I, where I came from to where I am today? I got a BS in psychology with a minor in business. I have extensive training and education in parental alienation, but I also have my master's magna cum laude in marriage and family therapy. I chose not to get my license because I work with hundreds, hundred times more clients than most therapists. And those therapists who are working with parental alienation are constantly being attacked by the alienator. They'll have false charges against their license, um, false lawsuits filed against them. For me, I couldn't spend every week defending myself. I would never be able to help my clients. So I made a choice not to get my license and to be able to consult, provide life coaching, and expert advice and testimony as needed. Yeah. I have been running a nonprofit, a 501c3 now, pretty much for 25 years, with it being established as a nonprofit since 2010 or 11. Mm -hmm. I'm also an ADA advocate, and what that means is I'm Americans with Disability Act advocate, an expert in, in uh, disabilities, so I can help a client who's make sure that the playing field is leveled for them when they're in court, especially if they're a pro se, by teaching them what their rights are. Excuse me. Uh -huh. um, and as you know, 99%, or you should know, 99% of parents who are going through alienation have PTSD, stress, and anxiety at some level. Really? No, I didn't know that. There's no way you couldn't. It's a living death. When yeah. we lose a child to a death, they're buried, and we know yeah. where they are. Yeah. They're in the ground or their ashes have been spread. But like a kidnapping, the child is physically and psychologically and emotionally unavailable. While they may be physically alive, they're physically, emotionally and psychologically dead to that other parent. Mm -hmm. They don't know how they're really doing, where they're where they are in many cases. And so that becomes a living death, just like having a child kidnapped physically. Okay. This is a mental kidnapping. Yeah. And I never really thought of the PTSD in in that aspect. Uh, but, you know, when you do lose someone, whether it's just like you mentioned, a spouse, 
or something like that. It is traumatic. And for and I really know that I went through it because in my first marriage, um, my ex former wife, I like to say former wife instead of ex wife. Uh, but my former wife just went off on the deep end. And I know the divorce took her by shock. I'm well aware of that. And that's on me. But I never thought about it as being PTSD. That's a great Very, analogy. It, yeah, 99% of my cases have it. The 1% that don't, I have to wonder if they're really an alienation case. Hmm. Because if you don't have some kind of emotional response to this, then there's something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. you, ha there, you have to. There's a lot of patterns through the 25 years that I've been doing this that I've noticed. 35 if you include um, domestic violence in and of itself that mm -hmm. I've been working in and studying. Um, what, some of the things we've noticed is that 99% of the alienators have been raised to believe they have to be perfect because if they're not perfect then they're not lovable if they're not lovable they're going to be abandoned if they're abandoned they're alone this terrifies them mm. now add in if somebody demands they have to go to therapy well in order for them to go to therapy they either have to admit that they're that they're not perfect mm -hmm. and now they're going to be panicked about losing and being abandoned or they go because they want to prove how they're perfectly sane and normal and they have no issues yeah so if it's court order that you have to go then that's what they're going to be trying to prove that they're perfect yes exactly they're going to be the ones trying to prove oh i'm perfect i there i have no issues everything's the other parents fall very typical pattern Another pattern we see is that 99% of them were abused as children, whether physically, sexually, or psychologically. And they're mm -hmm. projecting their family of origin issues, or what we term foo, F-O-O, through the children onto the other parent in an attempt to save little them. Because when they were growing up and being abused, nobody saved them. Mm. Yeah. So there's this, what I call a borderless boundary. The parent doesn't understand the borders or the boundaries between their emotions, their fears, their childhood, their life, and their children's. And they project that they onto the very kids. very enmeshed and entangled. Yeah. And part of the process is to untangle and unmesh it. Because the, while the children will claim they are the independent thinker and how, oh, this was all my idea. I don't want to see you because it's my idea. Mm -hmm. They're really not. They're parroting the other parents. Mm -hmm. Because the child themselves is in self-protection mode. Mm. terrified of not being perfect and therefore not lovable etc so it's mm. a very vicious circle almost and it's a, we need to break that circle yes yeah, so, because it gets multi-generational and passed down yeah. from generation to generation yeah so if you don't break that chain as they say then it's continue to go on and on and on well that's why we have so many more cases of narcissists and parental alienation because it's grown exponentially federal governments figure that each family has 2.5 kids. Mm -hmm. Well, if 75% of marriages are ending in divorce, okay, or if we want to even just work with a nice even number, 50%, okay, are ending in divorce. Mm -hmm. And Excuse of that 50%, 10% 10 are on the court records as being parental alienation cases or custodial issue, issue cases. Well, the 2.5 kids, that means we're growing exponentially with, you know, another two kids or one and a quarter kids who may end up alienating or getting into a relationship with somebody who's an alienator. Mm -hmm. So Joan, what would the criteria be to, be to show that you're being alienated against? There are many criteria. I actually, let's start with Bill Burnett. He finally said, you know, this stuff and we have 17 categories here, 12 categories. He said, five factor model and he's got five factors that he utilizes mm -hmm. to start the process things like not seeing the children um denigrate you know frivolous excuses for not seeing the kids mm -hmm. things like this um if people want all of this info definitely email me or it's out there on my website okay um then there's amy baker who started out with 17 strategies that she's reduced down to 11 and then I have something called red flag behaviors, which is 11 categories 
or it's actually 200 red flag behaviors that are broken down into 11 categories. And then my sheet automatically tallies a number as to how severe the case is or isn't, how many impediments there have been, mm -hmm. how many impediments total, how many impediments per category, how many categories are impeded in. So these are different ways to recognize patterns. But for an example of a pattern of a behavior might be the other parent um, convincing the kids to call the new significant other mommy or daddy hmm. that's a sign lack of visitation yes that's a dead give that's an obvious yeah. Yeah. um children coming to your home and they're being vitriol they're being nasty they're hiding in their rooms that's a red flag um being denied access to education and medical records even though the courts have ordered it um not being able to communicate with your ex because it's constant battle that you say one thing and they're going to completely go in the opposite direction. Just um, a spike. And because they, because the alienator needs total control. Okay. If they don't have total control, they go, they, they lose it or they will either walk away from the situation. But when it comes to the children, if they have that total control of the children, they're not going to walk away from it. Mm. Okay. Because that's their, that's their, meat and potatoes, if you will, of how they're going to get back at the other parent. Mm -hmm. It's why I like to refer this to this often as domestic violence by proxy. Mm -hmm. When a child is used to exact revenge and anger and rage at the other parent, mm -hmm. using frivolous excuses, etc., that's domestic violence by proxy. Okay. When somebody files false allegations of abuse or neglect mm -hmm. with Child Protective Services, that's domestic violence by proxy. They're using an agency to do their bidding. When that person starts filing all sorts of frivolous motions and lawsuits, including circumventing child protective services who has unsubstantiated the charges, and they go into court now and the parent isn't happy with what child protective services has said, and they file criminal charges of abuse and neglect. Mm. That's domestic by by violence by proxy using the courts. Any... Yeah. Just anything where somebody else is doing their bidding for them, if you will. Yeah. So anytime that a a parent is trying to keep you pretty much away from your kids, really, boil down in whatever right. form that they can do it, that's uh, domestic violence as well. But does yes. the court see it that way? Well, it depends on what court you're in. It's things are changing what we're seeing is that um back let's i'm going to go all the way back some 25 years ago when my husband's case was in the courts okay believe it or not the judge got it he actually turned to my husband's ex and said ma'am i'm not a psychiatrist and i'm not a psychologist but you need one she had been caught filing fraudulent um documents for daycare a day camp she was caught filing fraudulent documents for dentists and the judge she was really upset with this but the problem was 25 years ago we just barely knew the term parental alienation mm -hmm. let alone know what to do about it so the judge back then his response was to keep giving her new court orders so we spent 10 years getting new court orders it was always bad girl here's a new court order Bad girl, here's a new court order. Bad girl, here's a new court order. Well, mm -hmm. by the time we kept going through this and getting all these new court orders, the kids were 16 and 18. There wasn't much more we could really do because at that time there were no reunification programs. There, were no, there was no information, enough information out there for, for anybody to sink their teeth in. And there was no trained professionals to do the therapy mm -hmm. at that time. And see, and now your husband we have a lot more it. experts. Yeah, your husband right. went through it my the same time that I did. My husband went through it. Your yep. brother? That's probably true. Yeah. Now, when you were going through it, I can tell you the triggers. One was because you asked for the divorce. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you took all the control. The minute you took back that control, that's when all hell hits the fan. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to explain it another way. We have something we teach our clients called HHSS. Happy, healthy successful, spiritually positive, happy, enjoy your life. You deserve mm -hmm. that healthy mind and body. Mm -hmm. You should be in therapy. 
it's important. I don't care whether you go once a week or once a month or once every two months. It's having somebody to talk through and to make sure that you're not being triggered, that you're monitoring and managing your the, these things that are so toxic. Mm -hmm. Body, I don't care if you're a triathlon athlete. I just want you to exercise and take care of yourself. Could be going for a walk, could be going for a swim, it could be going to the gym. Anything that gets your blood pumping so that you get fresh, clean oxygen to all the cells in your body and especially to your brain. Because that is where we need to clear it out so that we can think and we can critically analyze what's going on and be able to be the best person we can be in our case yeah. or to help ourselves or our children. Yeah. Success it doesn't have anything to do with how much money you make. It's more about doing something that you enjoy. You could make six hundred thousand dollars and be the most miserable person in the world, or you could make sixty thousand and really be happy and enjoy your life. Mm -hmm. And then spiritually positive. This isn't about religion; it's about believing in yourself. H H S S isn't something you have twenty four seven. Nobody could have this. It's just not possible because life has too many ups and downs. Right. It's something we strive for, but the more H H S S you are, the more control you have. The more control you have the less control the other side has. The less control the other side has, the more out of control the other side gets to get the control back, the more obvious it becomes who the problem really is. And this is important when you're de yeah. dealing with court because you want to, you don't, when you take that control, they, they can't manage themselves. And so they really expose what's going on. Mm -hmm. I have had quite a few parents come back to me and tell me, you know, thank God I listened and I did that because I was able to project a safe, stable, secure person on a public Facebook or a public social media. And that began to draw my children in because they realized I wasn't what their other parent had told. Them. Yeah. But this brings us to another level. Back in the day, we didn't have Internet and these social media and what we have today. Mm -hmm. bring it forward and in the last you know 10 15 years it's blossomed with all this social media so that's helped to get more up-to-date information and research and um, resources out there to parents and even to the children mm -hmm. so one of the things we kind of start to notice is that as the children, if the children can get out of the, under the control of the other parent by going off to college or going out on their own, yeah. they seem to start getting it if they're in that 20-year-old year, year old batch right now. They're within the 20 to 25-year-old, 27-year-old. Mm -hmm. Now, why is this? It's a compound issue. About the age of 8 or 10, child goes from concrete reasoning to abstract reasoning. What this means as they go from a horse is a horse, because it has four legs, runs fast, has fur and says nay, actually they have hair, not fur, to why, what, where, and when. When they start to ask those questions, that triggers a fight, flight, freeze response in the other parent and they start pouring on the parental alienation because they're gonna fight back to make sure they maintain control. Well, as this progresses and the child grows and matures, the human brain actually will stop growing at about age 25. It stops maturing at about age 35. So this is why we, we start to see this change in dynamics sometimes somewhere around the age 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, because now they're starting to critically think. And if they have the resources accessible to them out on the internet and they can go start reading it, or they can see a social media of their parents saying, hey, went on a hike up the uh, such and such trail, saw mm -hmm. a mockingbird, whatever, um, or, you know, went to this great movie, oh, ha went to a museum, saying only positive things. It shows that this is a stable person. They're a normal person. Never, ever say anything on social media about missing your kids. You can say thinking about you. Maybe mm -hmm. you post an old picture or your kid made one of your handprints and you took a picture of it and you put that up and said, you know, I came across this today and it made me think of you. These oh. are positive things. Yeah. It shows the child, number one, you have memorabilia. You didn't throw it out. You care. Two, you do still think about them. 
Three, maybe you are not this horrible, terrible person. So these are ways to, to reframe and reconstruct who you are to the child without having to get into a tit for tat and, and fight with them. Will it work in all cases? No, but it's a start. And I agree with you. I, and I've told a lot of fathers the same thing. Just stay in touch. Send a card. Uh, send a letter just to let them know that you haven't forgot about them. Because that's one of the things that the kids think that you didn't think about me. You don't care about me. You don't love me. So if you do these little bitty things, and like you say, now you got social media, so you can put up a picture and say, hey, you know, I, I was just thinking about you and, and miss you and, you know, want to let you know I love you or whatever, that they can find it later. Because I agree with you. A lot of kids learn who their real parent is. You know, in both directions, because if you're the alienator, the kid is going to realize that you were the problem. And if you're the father and you stuck around and you, you know, said these things that you were mentioning, they're going to know that you really weren't the man that you Correct. were painted to be. Correct. Correct. Um and that is important. But remember, I don't want you using the word missing you or I love you. Okay. In part because it gets twisted. If you say you're missing, they say, well, if you miss me so much, how come you didn't reach out? But if you say you're thinking, there's no real, they can't say, well, if you're thinking about me, it doesn't work. You see? But couldn't they say, well, you were thinking about me, so how come you didn't call? Or how come you didn't send me see, okay, a card? So, right. Yeah. So your answer is, I'm sorry, but I didn't have a way to reach you. My husband, we had to stop reaching out to them because the only communication we had meant it had to go through the mother to them. Mm -hmm. Useless. Because the mother would open it, bad mouth it, so the kid doesn't, is already tainted against it. Mm. Nothing more we can do. So, but my husband's kids are in their 30s. So they're kind of outside that ten that block of kids who are very are getting mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And the other part of this is once you understand how to do critical thinking skills, which is really important, you can help your children when they say to you, well, how come you didn't reach out to us if you missed us so much? Well, if you have critical thinking skills, you can say, you know, you're right, and I'm sorry, but I didn't know how to reach you. The, all my contacts for you were either not going anywhere or were going and your mother was getting them or somebody mm -hmm. else was getting mm -hmm. them. And so I, I didn't know what to do. And you say, that's why I do stuff on Facebook or social media, because I'm hoping that maybe at least that way you'll get it without any issue. You know, there's ways to get them to critically think. Or you okay. could say, well, if I didn't miss you and I don't love you, then why did I save all these things for you? Mm -hmm. Why do I think about you? Why do I, you know, why did I fight in court for you so hard? Because I didn't want you in my life. You know, there's various critical thinking skills. Or like, for example, uh, you got the kid who says, you know, you abused me. Remember that time we were walking through the parking lot and you grabbed my arm? That was abuse. You hurt me. And you say, you know, that's not quite how I remember it. Yes, we were walking in the parking lot, but you darted out in front of a car. So I had to grab you by the arm to pull you back so you didn't get hit and killed and hurt critical thinking the kid has to go oh oh they start to put pieces together and if they don't okay. do it right then they might do it a little later on and all of a sudden the pieces they start to remember that's why sometimes having positive photographs around the kid might reject it and say oh well i was just i was just pretending you say oh that's interesting you you must be a really good actor or actress then you know, there's little things that you got it. You can say that you can say, oh, wow, you're really good at acting. Have you consider going to drama school? You know? <laughs> and, but getting them to critically think that that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't fit with what they actually know and so, knew about that parent. So let me ask you, how can a man learn to get that critical thinking knowledge is there a place that they can go or some of this is going to be just plain old common sense well we some don't of have it, that you can go out on the internet 
and they can do an internet search and say, how, what's critical thinking skills? How do you how do you teach someone to do critical thinking skills? And just start searching and reading and reading and reading. Because basically all you're doing is saying, is taking it and making them see that what they're being told doesn't match the mm -hmm. other side of the story. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't match, maybe it doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. So the, the key to it is it's just making sure that you are showing them the real you and that what they've been told is all together something different. And that's not true. And well, here's the thing. Right. That's true. But if there's something that happened, let's say they spanked the child and that was an issue. You said, you know, you're right. I did spank you and you're right. I probably shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not going to make excuses, but parents are just not perfect people. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. If Absolutely. there was, we wouldn't yeah. need all these self-help resources and websites and books. We'd have one resource that would be called the perfect parent. In fact, even at the age of 100, you're still learning to be a parent. Because 100 years ago, we didn't parent the way we parent today. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I'm a grandparent. And I know I don't parent my grandkids the way I parent my kids. Right because it's you, totally different yeah you learn you right. learn so different skills always remember, you don't have to be perfect admit you're not perfect but never ever ever admit to something that you didn't do yeah. why because it'll be used against you okay we yeah. all make mistakes that's part of being human we wouldn't be human if we didn't make mistakes yeah Absolutely. And I and I said that and, to parents all the time. You are there's no such thing as a perfect parent. And you, so you're not going to be perfect, but you do the best you can with the knowledge that you have. But correct. you still keep learning so that you can be the best parent that you could possibly be. Correct. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry. My hair keeps falling in my eyes. That's OK. Um, at any rate. So I think, yes, that is, is one of the main things that I try and press on parents. The other thing that I also try to press on parents to understand with attorneys, they're not really trained properly. They have no training in psychology or PTSD, stress or anxiety. Now, that being said, the National Council for Family Court Justices, the Chief Justices, the Chief Court Administrators got together in 2019 because they were very concerned about how the family courts were running, or I should say not running, and how dysfunctional they were and how much damage mm -hmm. they were causing to families both psychologically and financially. And they started making some resolutions they had at this conference, and it's called the Family Justice Initiative Pathways Program. And I'm not sure if it's called Family Justice Initiative Pathways Program, mm -hmm. but basically it boils down to this. They want the adversarial process stopped. They want more mediation and family services relations. They want to ensure that pro se's are not being railroaded and run over in the courts. They want to make sure that finances are not going to be an issue for a parent to be able to get a fair hearing, I believe, is part of the way they phrase it. But okay. Back to the education. They want to make sure proper training and education is in place. One of the biggest things and that I keep imploring of parents is reach out to your chief justice for your courts. Hmm. Ask them what they are doing with this Family Justice Initiative program. Have they implemented it? How are they implementing it? Is that um, nationwide? What? Yes, it's okay. national. Okay. And actually, they can also find that on my website, pas-intervention.org. Mm -hmm. Then on the home page, they scroll down a little bit. There's a big yellow box on the left that has all the stuff about the FJI. And on the right, there's a light blue <coughs> box that's got a bunch of information. It has a bunch of information in it that they can download all those documents. Some of which include one pagers with scientific research and studies and backing to them. Um, and now those are all gonna help them as far as if they're in court, um, if they're working with a, a professional who doesn't really understand alienation, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Getting them to read and educate themselves is very difficult, but these one pagers could help because they're short to the point and they're backed up with evidence and scientific research and studies. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, there was something else we were just talking about that I wanted to mention. 
keep going. Uh, it'll come to me. Okay. So uh, one of the things questions I had is in, in parental alienation, that does affect the child mentally and emotionally. Yes, Correct. and physically. And physically, yeah. In fact, you look at the ACEs study, they found that children who of who ACEs, which stands for, um, my brain just went, um, <laughs> childhood experiences. Um, ch it's about childhood experiences, and I can't remember what the A stands for. I'm sorry, my brain has got so many things going through it right now oh, it's but it's it basically it talks about how childhood experience adverse childhood experiences study how the adverse childhood experiences can cause cancer in children diabetes acid re GERD or acid reflux psychological issues suicidal issues criminal issues you name it because these children start to psychologically split they know something doesn't feel right, but they don't have a safe place to talk about it, explore it, because the alienators within their therapy sessions, they go home to the alienator, they're in self-protection mode so that they don't get abandoned by the alienator. And so this just is this horrific hamster wheel that they can't ever get off of. Yeah, and so that, that inadvertently is just stress that you're putting on the child. And that stress is yes. emotionally, physically, is really tearing them apart and tearing them apart. Well, I have quite a few cases where there's what we call Munchausen by proxy, Munchausen mm -hmm. by proxy rather, which is where one parent will claim the child has all these medical issues and keeps dragging him back and forth to all these doctors until they finally get to a doctor who will say, oh yes, he's got that. Mm -hmm. Or oh yes, he's got that. Mm -hmm. Just so they can say, well, I'm the only one who could possibly take care of this child. Oh no, no one else could do this. And this happens yeah. in quite a few cases. Yeah. Problem is getting a proper therapist or a professional who recognizes this and can address it. What so, happens is oh. the parent has gone to so many professionals. Half the time we don't know three quarters of the professionals they've consulted with until they finally get to the one who's going to give them what they want. Mm -hmm. We see so, this with therapy, too, yeah. where they will drop the therapist because the therapist figured out what's going on. Right. And now they're right. going to find one who's going to do their bidding. I actually had my former wife's attorney dropped her when he saw what she was doing. And see, that surprised too. me. But happily no. surprised me. Right. It happens. There are a few attorneys out there who have some ethics and values and morals. Yeah. One of the best ways to know whether your attorney is attentive and is really cares is you leave, you communicate to them. If they don't communicate back within 24 hours to 48 hours, even if it's just to say, hey, give me a, a couple of days, give me a couple of hours to respond, then they don't, they're, they're not doing their job. Okay. Under the co ethics code of for attorneys, they have a they have a, an obligation and a duty to return a communication within a timely manner. Yeah. And so, to be honest, if that attorney really wants to have their client not be triggered, not be off the wall, mm -hmm. the single most important thing that attorney can do is return the communication in a timely manner, whether they answer the questions right then and there or ask for a little extra time. Okay. Well, what can a father do if his formal spouse is consistently filing motions or false allegations? Okay. So we have a lot of um, things called torts and criminal charges and things that can be filed. I would, you can try and file them in family court, but I prefer filing them in civil court because family court really can't adjudicate on these type torts. Okay. So you have things like malicious prosecution, intentional infliction of emotional distress, negligent infliction of emotional distress, defamation, slander, perjury, fraud, fraud upon the courts, filing of false allegations, vexatious litigation, um, uh, coercive control, and custodial interference. Mm -hmm. These are all types of criminal and tort things that can be charged. Every single state in, and federally has a law for custodial interference. Okay. It's most attorneys don't even recognize to use this it's it, it's the same as kidnapping in essence but custodial interference means you're interfering with the custody of that child whether you've mm -hmm. taken them and kid them out kidnapped them out of the state or you're just not letting a relationship continue hmm. so, now and you the have others a book... are also ways no oh, i'm sorry 
I was going to say the other things like the malicious prosecution and in and vexatious litigation. That's what you use for when somebody's constantly filing. Now there is something else. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. There's an actual law that you can use that can be filed to stop um, this kind of behavior. And I want to say it's called the Kobe Law, Kobe Law, Kobe Law, something like. Ooh. If you want to know what it is, just email me, and I'll go looking for it. It's in my computer. I don't want to take time okay. looking for okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And because I think it's important because we, a lot of fathers don't have a recourse and they want to know what can they do there. And fathers, we get frustrated and we just throw our hands up and just say, ah, screw it. And, you know, go on about their life and the kid is still suffering. Then it, right, you know, it, you know, because... the, yeah, the parents are going to say, see, I told you he didn't love you. I told you he didn't care about you and go on exactly. about their business. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is there is no right or wrong answer to this, Mike. Yeah. It may be a matter of health that the parent has to step back and say, I've worked, I've done what I can. I fought as hard as I can. My health is starting to fail from this stressful situation. Yeah. I need to step back. And there is nothing wrong with taking a break and coming back to it. I yeah. kind of analogize it this way. I call it the festering wound. So you got a rash on your arm and you start to scratch it. And you scratch it a little more, and now it's red, and now it's scabbing, and it's bleeding, and it's oozing, and now it's infected. So you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, whoa, this is a huge infected wound. I'm sorry, i got to put ointment on it. We're going to have to cover it over. You can't open it up. You need to let this festering wound heal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that was what we need to do. We need to let the festering wound heal. We need to heal ourselves so that we can be there for our children when they finally get it. Besides the fact we deserve to be HHSS. <laughs> true true now you have a book out uh can you tell the audience a little bit about the book and what they're going to get out of the book in regards to you know the subject we're talking about today i actually have two books okay the first book i wrote was um i started writing based on a lot of the articles and research i had done for my master's program and i interviewed like a thousand parents um, for a lot of things, and that's how I came up with also one of my programs. Um, and we all came up with the title, Where Did I Go Wrong? How Did I Miss the Signs? Dealing with hostile aggressive parenting and parental alienation. Basically, this is, I tried to write this book as layman terms as possible. I find that when some of the experts talk, they're using these big convoluted words and not everybody understands them or because they've got such PTSD, stress, and anxiety. It's going in one ear, out the other, in one eyeball, out the other eyeball, and it's not, they're not hearing it. Mm -hmm. And I get that. So it, I tried to break it down into layman's terms and visuals so that someone can say, oh, I have this visual, or I can remember it because the words are something I can, I can remember. Yes, there is some technical terminology in the book. Of course there is. But basically, it talks about so many pieces of the process of what's going on, what's not, what not to do, what to do, um, resources. And then the other book is called Broken Family Bonds. It's poems and short stories from victims of parental alienation. Mm -hmm. And this book, the point of it was not just to help parents understand that they're not alone, that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of parents are going through this around the world, but also to show, if you, to show the judiciary, look, this isn't a small problem. There's, this book has a dozen stories of, on its own just in its second edition. You know, and this isn't something we pushed and pushed. These were just some of the stories that came into us that we put in there. And I just haven't had time to finish making it <laughs> part three and a part four of it. But they but can it, find... It, those things help. And they can find more information on your website, the PAS yes. intervention. And I'm yes. going to have that yes. information down um, in our notes and all of that. So, you know, audience, you can get that information. So don't worry about it. Yes, I have lots of other articles and I have, we, my nonprofit has the largest searchable database of professional experts in parental alienation. Mm -hmm. Is it everybody that's out there? No, it's a large collection of names. And if that person, 
if that person on that list that you call doesn't know anybody, we always ask for a referral. Say, do you know anybody? Never be afraid to ask, do you know somebody? Do you, can you refer me to somebody? Yeah, yeah. What is the worst that they can say? No. Yeah. <laughs> no is a two-lettered word. No means go on, turn it around, onward we go. Turn no around and you get the word on. For onward we go. Well, I would love in our like for you to put your information on our website so that the audience can find you as well along with this video and the audio because we have the audio piece out there too so but unfortunately Joan that is our time for today I could sit here and talk to you for hours about this because I've Absolutely. experienced it and I know a lot of fathers out there have experienced and you know I'm not going to say Dad. that our fathers are innocent because I know a lot of fathers have done the same thing to the formal spouse as well. So yes. I wanted to do this because I really wanted parents to know the effect that they're having on their child when they're, you know, forcing alienation on them. And so I thank you so much for coming on the show and cool. being a guest. And You're you've welcome. been a wonderful guest with a, a prolithia of information and so thank you so much you're welcome that's just the tip of the iceberg of my brain i i gather <laughs> <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen that's going to be our show for today and i really i do thank joan claude zanar for being on our show she has definitely brought some good information that you can use and to learn from and you know this alienation is a really a key thing that a lot of kids have gone through a lot of things that happen through divorce and i really would like along with joan i really like for it to end because i want the kids to have that h h s s i want them to have it as much as they possibly can and you need it as well because you don't need to go through this nonsense no more than anybody else but if you haven't subscribed to the show please do and click that notification bell so that way you can be notified at all times when we upload the show and if you are a father and you are looking for resources go to the father show with mike thompson .com and click on resources and there you can find resources that can help you and hopefully we can get joan information on there as well so that you can find her and, and and really become the best man that you can possibly be. You'll be happy. Your kids will be happy. And it's going to make a world of difference in your world. So until next week, I thank you for joining us. You can catch us on iHeart Radio. You can catch us on Stitcher, YouTube channel, um, Alexia, and iTunes. So Catch us, listen to us, and most of all, tell somebody else and let them know that we're here just for them. So until next week, God bless you, and I can't wait to see you to the end.